And Jesus is the only Savior. Loud and let the echoes ring. Jesus is the mighty healer. Gladly we the message bring. And Jesus is the great baptizer. Glory, hallelujah, sing. And we rejoice for he's our coming king. Sing that again. Oh, Jesus is the only Savior. Loud let the echoes ring. Jesus is the mighty healer. Gladly we the message bring. And Jesus is the great baptizer. Glory, hallelujah, sing. And we rejoice for he's our coming. One more time. Oh, Jesus is the only Savior. Loud let the echoes ring. And Jesus is the mighty healer. Gladly we the message bring. Jesus is the great baptizer, glory, hallelujah, sing. And we rejoice for he's our coming. Let's sing this out. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy we welcome his return. Again, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy, we welcome his returning. It may be more, it may be night or noon. We know our king is coming. Soon. Sing that again, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy, we welcome his returning. It may be morn, it may be night or noon. We know. Everywhere he went, he was doing good. That mighty healer, he cleansed the leper. When the cripples saw him, they started walking. Everywhere he went, my Lord was doing good. Everywhere he went, he was doing good. That mighty healer, he cleansed the leper. When the cripples saw him, they started walking. Everywhere he went, my Lord was doing good. One more time. Everywhere he went, he was doing good. That mighty healer, he cleansed the leper. When the cripples saw him, they started walking. Everywhere he went, my Lord was doing good. Saw him, they started walking. Everywhere he went, my Lord was doing good. And oh, for a thousand times.
for a thousand and all for a thousand hands to raise in honor to the king let's sing this out all for a thousand tongues and all one more time and let there be glory and honor and praise we exalt you Lord glory and honor to Jesus oh glory Because you deserve, above every other name, Lord, you deserve all of the glory and all of the honor in this place today. Lord, I just pray as we continue to worship you, Lord, as we hear from your word in a little while, Lord, may it just penetrate our hearts. May it fill our lives, Lord, with richness. I just pray for Pastor Jeff as he would stand behind that pulpit again today. Lord, may you strengthen him. Give him wisdom, boldness, and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's remain standing as we uh, sing one other song that uh, 
Pastor Jeff Wanda before he uh, came to share this morning. And uh, it says, who the sun sets free, amen, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Let's continue to sing this song before he comes this morning. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Sing that again. Who the sun, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. That the highest would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me know his love for me. Know his love for me. In the sun. a slave while I was a slave to sin. Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am As you know, this morning, Newfoundland and Labrador has a history of people leaving our great province to move to what we always call the mainland. And my kids still laugh at that when I say the mainland, but most of us here this morning know exactly what that means. So many Newfoundland and Labradorians have moved to the mainland to find work over the years. I don't have the exact number this morning, but I am confident in saying that even in the last 50 years, Hundreds of thousands of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have uprooted their lives to seek a living in different parts of Canada and the world. Back in the day, many people left to go to Toronto. Remember, where are you going? We're going up to Toronto. And they went to find work there in different parts of the nation. There's probably nobody listening this morning who has not had to say goodbye to family members who have left the rock for the mainland. My father was the oldest of five children, raised in Robert's home. He had three younger brothers and one younger sister. Some of them may be listening to me this morning, and I want to say hello to them from their favorite nephew. <laughs> Back in the early to mid-70s, like many Newfoundlanders at the time, all four of my father's siblings moved to the mainland to work. 
and three of them have remained there to this very day. Well, like my father, I am the oldest of five children. I have two, I have three younger brothers, like my father did, and one younger sister. And like all of my father's siblings in the 70s, all of my four siblings moved to the mainland for work in the late 80s and early 90s. And two of them are still there today. I went to the mainland to study, but came back to the rock and been, other than being in Goose Bay for a number of years, which is a part of our province, obviously, I have never left Newfoundland and Labrador to find work. Like most Newfoundlanders who have moved away, especially the older generations, my family members who live away still call this province home. And it's a phenomenon amongst Newfoundlanders. You can be away from the rock for years, and you can settle down and have a house and a family and have your roots there, but yet you'll still refer to Newfoundland as home. I've always found that quite interesting. And they still talk about and dream about coming back home for a time. As already been said, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador has designated 2022 as Come Home Year. On the Come Home Year website, you will find this invitation. And I quote, This is the reunion we've all been waiting for. A celebration for family and friends. Full of music, food, and fun. So no matter where you found yourself, no matter how long you've been away, consider yourself officially invited to come home in 2022. Well, thousands of people with strong roots to this great province have accepted this invitation, and they have decided it's time to come back home. Over the last few weeks and over the remaining weeks of the summer, and no doubt into the fall and maybe even into the winter, people will reunite with family and friends whom they may have not have seen for a while, and they will have a time. And Newfoundlanders know exactly what I mean when I say time. Now, there's some things about that time that we may not give any uh, here to, but yet you will have a time. For years to come, stories will be told about the year when Newfoundlanders from away took the time to come back home. And maybe some of you this morning are here because you came back home. Some of you may be listening online this morning, and you're listening right from Grand Falls, Windsor, but you have come back home, and you're tuning in this morning. Some of you are listening today, and maybe you can't wait to come back home. You couldn't do it this week or next week, but maybe in August, you're coming back home. Some of you may not be able to come back home, but you, oh, how, wish, how you wish you could come back home for a time. This morning, I want to take the next few minutes to share a coming home story, a story that Jesus told. It's a familiar story. It's a story about a great reunion between a son and his father. It's a story that starts off dark and sad, but it ends with a celebration. As I said, most of us are familiar with this story. It's considered by many to be the most touching of all the stories that Jesus told. And I want to take us a few moments this morning to look at it on this Come Home Sunday. Now, Jesus didn't actually put a title to this story, but throughout church history, it's been known as the parable or the story of the prodigal son or the rebellious and wasteful son. It's certainly a fitting title, as we will see in a moment, but some have called it the parable of the loving and gracious father. And we will look at that in a moment as well. It is recorded in Luke chapter 15, beginning Uh Oh, yeah, you got it. You got it. That, whoever that was, their timing couldn't have been better. <laughs> oh, oh, you got it. Bless you. Amen to that. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. 
As, Je- and as I said, Jesus is the storyteller here, and he begins with the son's request. It says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, and we'll stop there. According to the Jewish law, if a father wished to do so, he could distribute his wealth to his sons while he was still alive. They didn't have to wait till he was dead to get a portion of their inheritance. It was also perfectly legal for the younger son to ask for his share of the estate or his inheritance before his father had died. However, it wasn't the loving thing to do. In fact, it was a very disrespectful thing to do. It was legal, but yet somewhat unethical, I guess we would say. In Jewish culture of the day, by asking for the share of his inheritance while his father was still alive, was like saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Can you imagine? The son coming to his father and saying, I want a share of my, I want my inheritance. I want what is rightfully belongs to me. What his father heard was these words, I really wish you were dead. It was lack of respect. It was a lack of love for sure. In Jewish culture, that's exactly what this young man was saying. I wish you were dead. Such language to one's father was unheard of in the Middle East at that time. It violated the core of Middle Eastern culture. It called into question the authority and the dignity of the father. But the son didn't care. He was only thinking about himself. He was only thinking about what he could get and what he would do with what he received. He wanted what he considered rightfully belonged to him, and he didn't mind offending even his own father. So that was the request. Then Jesus gives us the father's response. So the father divided his property between them, between his two sons. Although the father is well aware of the mistake the younger son is about to make, he grants him his request. His his son is looking for independence. He's looking to do things his own way. He's looking to do things on his terms. He came to a place in his life where he felt he didn't need his father's help. He didn't need his father's advice. He didn't need his father's instructions. But he certainly wanted his father's money. So he didn't care. Give me what I want. And the father, out of love, not wanting to make his son a slave or a puppet, knowing that it wasn't the best decision the son would make, the father granted him his request. He divides his land between the two sons. He lets the younger son go his own way. And I only can imagine how much that broke the father's heart that day. It broke him. It changed him for sure. It it did something inside of him that day, knowing that his son was simply saying, I no longer have respect for you. I no longer care about you. In fact, I wish you were dead. Now give me what rightfully belongs to me, and I'm going to do life my way on my terms. But his father let him go. Then in verse 13, we come to the son's rebellion. Not long after that, it says, the son's rebellious heart began to manifest itself. It says the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. The New English Version translates the words this way. The words got together all that he had this way, he turned the whole of his share in cash. In other words, the younger son sells the portion of the land that his father gave him. That's what he would inherit. His father took the land, gave him the portion that belonged to his younger son, and he sold it to receive money. And Jesus says that he moved to a a distant country, more likely a Gentile city, which adds to the young man's list of failures 
disrespect and the acts of rebellion. He was a Jewish boy. To move to a, a Gentile city was an offense to Jews. Again, he was saying not only to his father, but saying to his culture and saying to his religion, I don't care about you. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it on my own terms. And he moved to a Gentile city. And it says there he squandered his wealth in wild living. He wasted all of his money on partying, if you would. He got involved with what would be self destructive behavior in the end. Later in the story, we read where the, old, the, sons, where the son's older brother accuses the younger brother of squandering their father's property or wealth with prostitutes. So he got involved in a lifestyle that was sinful, a lifestyle that was offensive again to his culture, to his parents, and to his religion. We see then that the father's land was gone and the money uh, the younger son got for it was now also gone, putting the family's financial failure at risk. Such an act of rebellion had also compromised the family's honor and place in the village as well as the family's ability to call on neighbors in times of trouble. One writer summed it up with these words, the family would be excluded from social and economic relations. So what a mess this young maid, man made of things. He squandered his money. He went to the Gentile city. He lived a life of a playboy, if you would, and he, he messed around with things he shouldn't have messed around with, and, and, and he caused offense to his family, his culture. He caused others to look down on his father. He caused others to look down on his family and even exclude them from financial transactions and social get-togethers and so on. So what a price the family paid for this young man's independence and rebellion. Verses 14 to 16 outlines the son's ruin. It says, after he had spent everything, he spent everything he had. It says there was a severe famine in the entire country, and the young man began to be in need. Everything was gone. There was a famine. There was a lack of food, a lack of resources. So it says this young man went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country. He soldered a Gentile employer, again offensive to a Jew, a Gentile employer who sent him to, to his fields to feed his pigs. I just want to use my imagination for a moment again in that culture, that time, to associate with Gentiles for a Jew to do that was certainly offensive, to say the least. And this employer knew this young man was a Jew. He knew he was desperate. And it was almost like an act of defiance or mockery. He said, I got a job for you. You're desperate. You need money. I'll send you to the pig farm. I'll send you to my fields, and there you will find my, my pigs, and, and they need feeding. And that's where the young man went. He longed to fill his stomach, the Bible says, this verse says, with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. What desperation. He had lost all his money. As I said, there was a famine. He's alone. He has no friends now. The friends he partied with are gone. They disappeared. They took advantage of him. They enjoyed his company when he had all the money and all the things he needed. They enjoyed all the, the good times, but now they were gone. His money was gone. He was down and out. He was broke, and he needed a job. As I said, he finds a job feeding pigs for a Gentile businessman. And as a Jew in that day, this young man could not sink any lower than caring for the pigs of a Gentile, an absolute insult. One writer he said, a symbol of the son's depravity. That's how far he had plummeted. That's how far he's gone from home. 
He's starving to the point that he even considered eating the pods that the pigs were eating. These pods were blackberries growing on low shrubs and contained very little nutritional value. They were considered food for the poor, and and farmers would take those so-called pods and and cut them and, and throw them into the pig's pen for the pigs to eat. And this young man was so desperate, he considered even eating the pods. But I find it interesting, when I read this the other day, it doesn't say that he actually ate them. It says he longed to fill them. That's how desperate he was, even long for the pods, and it says, but no one gave him anything. So it's almost like the Gentile employer said, you're not even allowed to eat the pods. You're not even allowed to eat the garbage that I'm giving to the pigs. He longed to eat that, but not even that was available to him. Imagine how far he sunk. When I was a youth pastor in Springdale back in 1990, I guess, to 94, that was when we had a Pentecostal school system, and I remember as a young man, youth pastor with a, a great youth group, and I remember speaking at a school assembly on a Friday morning, wondering what to speak on, and this is a long time ago, and it came back to me uh, yesterday as I jotted down some notes for this morning. And I remember reading the prodigal son. It was a, a couple of days before I had to speak, and, and as I was reading it and I thinking you know, of it, this title came to mind. Sucked in, set up, and ripped off. And I remember going to that assembly on that Friday morning, and I, I shared with the young people uh, about, the, about sin and what sin could do, and I, I shared with them how that sin will suck you in. Sin will set you up. And at the end of the day, sin will rip you off. This young man in this story, he thought everything was going to be wonderful Just give me the money. Give me the land. Let me sell it. I'll take my money, and I will move to a city, and I will get an apartment there, and I will party day in and day out, and I will enjoy that. You've restricted me too much, he was saying to his father. I'm going to have a time there. I'll have lots of friends, and we'll do what we've always wanted to do. But now he finds himself. He got sucked in. He got set up by the glitz and the glamour of the city. Now he finds himself ripped off in a pig's pen with nobody and nothing around him. He's desperate. But then we come to verse 17 and 19. And the story begins to take a turn, a turn for the better. It says, we hear, we see the son's reasoning. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Something is happening. Something is beginning to stir this young man. He's beginning to get a re- reflect upon what it was like back home. What he thought was bad was wonderful now. He, the waste, wasteful and rebellious young man begins to have a change of heart. He experiences what I believe was deep conviction, which led him to some deep soul searching. Something tells him on the inside It's time to go back home. Something tells him, you know, maybe I'll be accepted if I'll go back home. I'm willing to take the chance. So he prepares a speech of repentance. He says, this is what I will say to my father for the mess that I've made of things. There are three elements to his speech. Number one, he confesses his guilt. He says, I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He, admit, he will admit that he's done what he's done was destructive. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He realizes there's a price that he might have to pay for his behavior. But then he suggests a solution. He says, make me one of your servants. So he had it all thought through. I will admit that I was wrong. I will admit that what I've done was stupid and destructive. And I will offer myself to work as one of my father's servants. That was the plan. 
Then we come to verse 20. We see the son's return. Somehow he, he put together enough strength. Somehow he got out of the pig's pen and, and cleaned himself off the best he could. I don't know how he got back to the land that he came from, but it says he got up and he went to his father. He may have walked. He might have hitched a ride. I don't know. It doesn't say. But he went to his father. But listen to what it says. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Just think about these words. This boy in a mess, broken and ruined, dirtied, stained with sin. His father sees him. And filled with compassion for him, he ran to his boy. He threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Man, that's an hour sermon there, guys. His father saw him. He ran to him. He was filled with compassion for him. Ryan's got to run. Thank God for first responders. Bless them. Pray for whatever's going on there today. He ran to him, filled with compassion. He ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Some scholars believe that the words, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, imply that the father never stopped hoping for and looking for his son's return. He saw him. Picture it with me. Day after day. We don't know how long the son was gone. But day after day, the father, picture, use your imagination with me. He will walk out on the porch of his house, and he will look to the distance. I wonder, is this the day? I wonder, is this the day my son is going to come home? I wonder, is this the day he's going to return? Where is he? What's he doing? I wonder, is this the day? He never stopped hoping for and looking for his son's return. The phrase, filled with compassion, it speaks of the father's love for and the willingness to forgive his son. There is no sense here that the father is angry. There's no sense in this verse that the father is going to reject his son. The complete opposite is true. He loves him unconditionally. He wants him to come home. He's not about to turn him away. Then it says the father ran to his son to meet him. That's an interesting way of putting it in that culture. One writer said it really means that the father strained to the utmost to reach his son. He was determined to get to his son. That day, day after day, he waited and he looked, he longed for. And one day he saw him. He's coming. He proud. There's no reference to the, the father's wife or the son's mother. But again, I can imagine the father saying to, to his wife, come and see, come and see, somebody is coming down the lane. Come, is it him? Somebody is coming. I can see him in the distance. I've been waiting. I've been longing. Somebody is coming home. And he says to his wife, I got to go meet him. I can't wait for him to get to the veranda. I got to run to meet him. I got to meet him somewhere along the path. I need to be where he is. I need to put my arms around him. I need to love him. I need to kiss him. I need to show compassion. Yeah, he messed up, but my boy is coming home. My boy is coming home, and he runs. He runs. He strains himself to do so. He puts that extra effort. But there's more going on here. You see, in the Middle East, as you know, in those cultures, even today, men wear robes. For a man to run, even today, I believe, it, mean, it meant that they would have to lift his robe somewhat to expose his legs. And men were not supposed to show as much of their ankles in that culture. The robe is supposed to touch the ground or the sandals. No part of the leg is to be exposed. It would be an indignity to do so. It would be, would be insulting. It would be throwing away your self-dignity to lift your robe. But this father didn't mind. He didn't mind humiliating himself for his son. So he lifted his robe because you can't roll, run with a robe hanging to the ground. He lifted the robe, exposing his legs, which was absolutely humiliating 
Dr. Brian Stiller writing on this parable. He says, by doing so, by lifting his robe, he tarnishes his own reputation rather than exposing his son to the humiliation of the townspeople. He said, I will take the humiliation myself. You see, you need to understand that there was something in the Jewish culture called the Gesessa. And when somebody like this young boy, this young man, uh, rebelled against his father and, and, and despised him and did what he did, the community could come together. If a boy showed back in the community, they could gather around him and they could even stone him to death. They could humiliate him, they could insult him, and they, they could kick him out of the village for insulting his father and squandering his inheritance and working for a Gentile and feeding pigs. The news probably got out. This boy did everything possible to insult his dad. And the townspeople could have gathered around him and treated him unkindly and possibly could have stoned him to death. And the father knew what could happen. And the father said, I'm going to run to my boy. I'm going to put myself in arm's way. I'm going to wrap my arms around my son. I'm going to put my head on his shoulder. I'm going to hold him close. And the townspeople won't be able to touch him. They will not be able to humiliate him. The enemy will not be able to hurt him. I'm going to stand in the gap for my boy. My son who was lost is now coming home. I've waited a long time. I know he's messed up, but I love him anyway. I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to reinstate him. I'm going to reconcile with him, and we're going to be good again. So townspeople, enemy right now, back away. I'm going to protect my boy. And that's what he did. He lifted up his robe and he ran down that dusty trail towards that stinky boy whose garments were tattered and torn. You could smell him a mile away. He was living with the pigs. Think about it. He looked unkept. He looked unhealthy. He was a broken man. The townspeople were probably running too. They got the news. He's coming back. This is the day we're going to send them packing again. This is the day we're going to kick them out of town. This is the day we're going to kick them out of the family. This is the day we're going to limit his involvement with his mom and his dad and his entire village. But the father says, not today. My son is coming home. And I'm going to meet him on that dusty road. And then we read the son's repentance. He comes to his father and he says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is a part of the speech that the son rehearsed in the pig's pen, but he couldn't even finish it before the father interrupts. He couldn't even finish. Is it like the father was saying, I know your heart. I know you're sorry. You don't have to say anything else. I love you. I love you. It's okay. It's going to be okay. The son's heart was now in the right place. I'm sorry. I don't believe he was doing it just to con his father. I don't believe he was doing it just to trick his father. I believe that something transpired in the pig's pen that day, and he had a change of heart. He said, if I go back home, I'm willing to repent. I'm willing to humble myself, and I'll take a job as a servant if need be. But I need to go back home. Before he finished his speech, his father said this, and it speaks of the son's restoration. The father shouted, quick, he says. He says to his servants, bring the best robe and put it on my son. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, he says. The father doesn't beat the son up in any way. What he does is instruct the servants to go and get the best robe and put it on him and get a ring, put it on his finger, put sandals on his feet. These are significant actions. The robe on the son, he said, put the robe on the son, signifying that it was restoring the son's dignity. Put a fresh robe on him, restore his dignity. Put a ring on his finger, the father said, signifying that he was restoring his authority as well as the wealth that he had squandered. He was saying, my son is home. I'm going to restore his authority. I'm going to give him back some money. By putting shoes on his feet, the father was signifying that the son would not be considered a servant, but a free man. He would be a son again in his father's house. And the killing of the fattened calf means 
that they were about to have a time. It means they were about to have a party. And then we read about the reunion. It says, let's have a feast, he said, and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they begin to have a time. They begin to celebrate. There was dancing in the house that day. There was food in the house that day. People gathered. Townspeople probably came because they realized the father had reinstated the boy. There's nothing else we can do. We're not going to touch him now. They came and they celebrated. But the son who was dead, was dead and distanced, broken and beaten, has been found and is now alive. And they began to celebrate. What a beautiful story. And I took considerable time to work our way through it this morning. The story of a father being reconciled to his wayward and wasteful son. A story of grace, forgiveness, and restoration. However, I want to remind you this morning, Jesus didn't tell it just for the sake of telling a great story. Jesus told this story the reason, the same reason he told many stories, and that was to teach a spiritual truth. He told the story in response to the Pharisees, the religious elite of the day who were criticizing Jesus for spending time with sinners, those who had wandered away from God. Jesus spent time with them. Thank God for that. He sat with sinners. He ate with them. And in this chapter, we see the Pharisees are ridiculing Jesus for doing so. And Jesus tells a number of stories. And he tells this one, which was my favorite, the prodigal son. And the big idea here this morning is that there's a way back home. Home referring to a personal relationship with God. The Father here reminds us of God. There's a way back home a way back to a relationship with God. As I said, the father pictures God and the son pictures those who have wandered away from him and are now living a life of sin. You see, we have all requested our spiritual independence. It happened in the Garden of Eden long time ago. The story is told, and you may know it, where God said you must not eat of this tree, but Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and by doing so, they demanded, requested their independence, and God allowed them to do it. Rebellion arose in their hearts, and they went against God, and and, and that that request and that, that sin, we call it, it has coursed its way down through history ever since. And the Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way. It says in Romans 3, 23, we have all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have been tainted by sin. Many of us have found our way back home, back to the cross, back to Jesus. Most of us here in this audience, no doubt this morning, we're wandering, all of us were wandering like sheep, but we've all come back to the Father. Some of us went further in sin than than others, but we were sinners, but we heard the call of the Father. Spiritually speaking, we were all in a pig's pen, but we came to our senses. What I believe that is, is the Holy Spirit convicting us and drawing us to come back home, and many of us have come back to the Father. You see, sin causes ruin. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. There's consequences to sin. Sin entered the human race and messed up human race from that time till this until Jesus comes again. But Jesus died and he rose again that our sins might be forgiven and we as individuals might be restored to the family of God again. A friend of mine used to say this. I don't know if he, he coined it himself or if he borrowed it from someone else. And I've probably said it here before. I like the way he put it. He said, sin will take you further than you ever intended and keep you longer than you intended to stay. Sin will take you further than you ever intended to go and it will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. Sin will suck you in. Sin will set you up. And at the end, sin will rip you off. The wages of sin is death. 
Jesus said there's a wide road, there's a narrow road. There's no in-between. He said the wide road most people follow, but it leads to destruction. What road are you on this morning? Let me ask you this question this morning. Are you wandered away from home? Are you away from the Father this morning? Sin will suck you into his grip, set you up for failure. And in the end, as I said, it will rip you off. But the good news is this, that through Jesus Christ, very simple this morning, there's a way back home. Do you still believe it this morning? Do you believe it? There's a way back home. The invitation is to all of us, to whosoever will, can come to return home. And let me give you this invitation. It's time to come back home, and the time to do it is today. Yes, we must repent. We must be sorry for our sin, as this young man was, sorry for offending his father. We must be sorry for offending our heavenly father. We must admit our guilt. We must be willing to fall on our knees and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. And when we do that, we can be restored and reunited with the Father. And I still believe this morning, just like the book says in this chapter, when one comes back to the family, there's a party in heaven. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that when one person who's gone far away from the Father and from home has wandered long but comes back to the Father, I believe there's rejoicing in heaven for even one person who comes back home to God today. Let me go back to, to the website, the Newfoundland website. I don't know whoever wrote it. We're thinking from a spiritual perspective, but I sometimes see these things and make a spiritual parallel. The last phrase is this. No matter where you found yourself, and the worship team is coming, no matter where you found yourself, no matter how long you've been away, Consider yourself invited to come back home. Let me read that again. No matter where you found yourself, maybe you're in a pig's pen, symbolically speaking, this morning. Maybe your life is a mess because of sin. It's taken you further than you ever intended to go. It has kept you longer than you ever intended to stay. No matter how long you've been away, it says, Consider yourself invited by the Holy Spirit to come back home. It's time to come back home. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Whether in this audience or listening online this morning, the prodigal son is a beautiful story. The story of recklessness, the story of restoration. A story of hope. Some listening today, no, you may not have gone as far as the prodigal went when it comes to how far he may have gone in sin, but the Bible says there's no measure. We can't measure the degree of sin. Sin is sin. If you're listening today here or online and you say, Pastor, I, I'm a prodigal. I've been away from home for a long time. Maybe you once experienced the good things of God. For whatever reason, you've distanced yourself from Him. You've gotten cold in your relationship. You, you have what we call backslidden. You've rejected God for this season. There's a way back home. The way is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a way back home. Maybe you're listening today and you say, Pastor, I've never really even begin to serve the Lord. There's a way home today. Home to the Father. Home to the Father God who has great plans for you will give you the hope of eternal life. I'm going to pray with you this morning and we're going to sing an old invitation number that I remember singing as a kid growing up and, and not, no doubt all of us have heard it. We're going to sing it in a moment softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling Father, we bow in your presence this morning. And I thank you today that there's a way back home. And today is the time to come back.
The old now is to accept the time. The old now is a day of salvation. And I pray this morning, Lord, for those who may be in this audience, and I don't know everybody here, but somebody who needs to come home today. Thank you for come home year. Thank you for reunion. Thank you for family and friends and fun. But Lord, the most important home to come home to is a relationship with you. And I pray today that somebody listening might realize and come to their senses that they need to come back home to you. And they will admit today their sin and repent of their sin to you and confess their sin and accept you as their Lord and Savior and to come back home. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing this number and this altar is open this morning? We give an altar call. If you're here today and you'd like to come down front this morning to commit your life to Jesus on this Come Home Sunday, what a day. What a day to come home to the Lord. Come Home Sunday 2022. The altar is open. Pastor Derek is here. He will meet with you, pray with you, and ask the Lord to help you on your journey. Come back home today, softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Byron, I'll take the other mic because this one is a little bit too hot for me. So let's do it. Come. 